Hi, I'm Jeffrey Botkin. I'm getting more and more questions about capital and what's going to be happening in, in private business in the, in the United States and where the global economy is headed. And one big question is this, can my business make it without government stimulus checks? And the short answer, of course, is yes, of course you can make it. And if you don't know the greatest American businessman of all time, I want to introduce you to him in this video. He died in 1916, but he can still prove to you in the next 40 minutes why and how government handouts could ruin your business and your country and your life because it's not the kind of capital you need or want. Now, of course, the follow-up question reads like this, yeah, but what if all my competitors are taking government stimulus programs and waivers and incentives and cash? How am I going to compete? Well, if they take the money and you don't, you will be more independent than they are, and you will be able to maneuver and plan and execute free market strategies far better than they can. And you will be free to grow. And this is not just business theory. This has been proven in the business history of the United States. And the most vivid illustration of this comes from the days of the rail barons, the men who built transcontinental railroads. Railroading was the big tech of the day and the big money of the day. A handful of rail barons trafficked in big capital, land, steel, labor, and government incentives worth well over a trillion in today's dollars. These rail projects attracted the best engineers and the most brilliant administrators of the time. So why did only one of the transcontinentals make a profit? Every railroad which took government handouts went bankrupt, losing billions and then billions more. The one man to refuse the handouts prospered, leaving a massive legacy to his heirs. His name was J.J. Hill. Exactly what was it that made him the greatest businessman in American history? Let's pick up the story in the 1860s after the destructive American war between the states burned itself out. Millions of Americans moved away from post-war politics and post-war poverty and post-war overcrowding. They traveled west. New European immigrants joined them, taking great risks to settle the wide open free western frontiers. And they did this as really hardworking pioneers. Now, of course, predatory politicians wanted to micromanage this explosion of freedom and expand their power through coast-to-coast -coast railroads. They kicked off their micromanagement and social engineering with bureaucratic grants, loans, treaties, gifts of free land, administrative strings, and endless regulations. Opportunists were right there to take advantage of all this government interference. And the result? This period from the war between the states to World War I turned out to be America's greatest all-time expansion of bold economic growth and runaway government power. The two extremes can be seen in the lives of two men who lived through these challenging opportunities. One was a hero, the other a villain. One took every free subsidy he could wangle out of the government and like a white collar wolf of Wall Street, Henry Villard double-dipped and then triple-dipped and winked and connived and lived like a king. He put lawmakers in his pocket so he could lobby them. He gained the system from every possible angle. He destroyed himself in the process, and he died an unhappy failure. The other man, J.J. Hill, was another poor immigrant who understood what capital represented. He refused to take even one dime of the billions which were on the table. And this was a deliberate decision made over and over again all through his life. His railroad not only made it across the Rockies through Indian Territory, reaching the Pacific Ocean, his railroad was the only transcontinental which was not marked by corruption, failure, intrigue, murder, and bankruptcy. His railroad became stunningly profitable. And why? Why was this? What was the dramatic difference there were two very different understandings of capital.
The American Northwest was America's last epic frontier. The states from Minnesota to Washington made up one-sixth of the nation, but remained empty and undeveloped for years. The climate was harsh and the terrain was imposing, but there were economic assets in the trees, the coal, the copper, the gold and silver, and tillable land, but all Henry Villard could see was the epic U.S. government handouts. Villain Henry Villard was the consummate opportunist. And even more than fame and fortune, Villard wanted the raw power that he could wield from the comfort of his New York mansion, which he built partly from warmongering gains. He was known in some circles as the man who financed Lincoln's war against the Constitution. And so, calling in every favor he now could, he put out his hand for congressional subsidies. According to a new and ridiculous government scheme, opportunists like Villard were awarded 6,400 acres of prime real estate for every one mile of track completed by his new railroad. And so they built what? They built crooked linear miles, a cheap snake-like roadbed, which was dangerous to passengers. Much of it would later need to be abandoned or torn up and rebuilt. At one point, Villard was burning $90 million per month to lay questionable infrastructure while enjoying temporary fame as a railroad baron. He built swanky hotels and exclusive spas in that scenic wilderness to entertain potential investors and congressmen. As for his interest in the future of America's free market and her currency and political integrity, he ravaged all three to get as much free stuff as he could as he could talk out of crooked politicians, some of whom received kickbacks. And yet, Villard could not make one dime of profit, even though he cheated workers and used the cheapest materials and skimped on bridge construction and enticed ignorant investors. And when he begged for protection from consequences and from his competitors like J.J. Hill, his political cronies delivered. And yet, within a very few short years, Henry Villard was forced out of his company, which was failing spectacularly. Now let's broaden the lesson. Villard's empire was not the only transcontinental to go bankrupt. Every railroad which accepted government subsidies failed spectacularly. The Union Pacific, Central Pacific, Northern Pacific, and Santa Fe existed solely because of government aid. In all the government chartered and subsidized railroads, inefficiency, shoddy production, waste, corruption, scandal, murder, theft, and bankruptcy corrupted Washington and threatened the integrity of American business enterprise. So how did the railroad of the poor immigrant boy become the only transcontinental not to go bankrupt. J.J. Hill was not simply building a transportation business, he was building civilization. He invested his capital in civilization. He spent his capital incubating civilization by enlarging civilizational capital for his entire nation. He loved America. He wanted to build it up. Now this is an advanced entrepreneurial concept and J.J. Hill built the world's largest business library, which still stands today, to try to get some very big picture ideas across to coming generations, to us. And this is why we need to study his life. But where did he learn all this? His dad died when he was 14. He left school after fourth grade to help provide for his family in Canada and he soon emigrated to America for a couple of reasons. His family could use the money that he would send home, but there was an even bigger reason, and we can see this in Hill's life even when he was a boy. J.J. Hill knew that America could use what he had to offer at a unique moment of, of history. If America's economy was to grow to its fullest capacity, she needed better transportation solutions, and Hill could see those solutions, he could see those connections. So he started with wagons, and then riverboats, and then warehouses, and, and then high-tech locomotives, and finally, high-tech trans-Pacific steamers. Because he reinvested all his first small profits, he never took a salary from his businesses or a dollar from the American taxpayer. 
He simply kept learning as he went, maximizing all those small profits and then reinvesting again. With his own money, he financed improvements for every railroad mile that he needed because he did not need government money. He didn't need government dollars. Now his railroad rivals and his government hated him for this and they tried to obstruct him continually. So J.J. Hill had to spend necessary millions of dollars on legal fights against irrational new laws and lawsuits and regulations. And yet, still, his personal capital continued to expand because he was rapidly enlarging the capital base of an entire civilization. James Hill made some really good business decisions in his life, but that is not what makes him fascinating, unique, and a, and a man worth studying. Let's take a look at the consistent trajectory of his entire life, from the earliest records that we have to the very last week of his life. I've, I've, been, stu I've been studying him, and I've just been more fascinated the more I look into this. I've identified three main principles which informed his decisions, which mark his vision for business and professionalism and freedom and civilization and, of course, capital. Here's the first one. He did not pursue his own fortune, his own identity, or his own personal empire. He was more jealous for civilization than he was for his own success, his own money. He fought more for civilization than his own brand identity. And as that civilization began to take shape, he worked really hard to protect it from the obstructions of dishonest government and unjust war and technological stagnation and over-regulation. Now, here's a quote, <clears throat> he said. The wealth of the country, which he really wanted to protect, its capital, and he knew that it was more than just dollars, and its credit, he said, must be saved from the predatory poor as well as the predatory rich, like Villard, but above all, he said, from the predatory politician. And now he was actually trying to save the free market so that we and our children could make use of those freedoms. And he, worked, he spent his own money for this. The battles that he fought really took a toll on his life, but he really fought them. They were expensive in terms of time and his own personal money and his own personal plans. All the time he took fighting these battles in Washington took away from other things that he could be doing. He spent millions of his own dollars to overturn the combined destructive effects of dishonest government in Washington, unjust war, primitive technology, and an overregulated market. That's what he inherited. That's what he was fighting in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And he held out high hopes that the strong work ethic represented by the thousands of families that he would be bringing to the United States from Europe would ultimately replace all that corruption that he was seeing around him. One honest family at a time. Here's number two, the second principle. He was himself a professional steward of the capital that he controlled, and he wanted to set a good example of this. He wanted to be a faithful family man, an honest businessman, to help as many families as he could. He, he constantly did all the math, all his business math, because he wanted to get his freight costs as low as possible for the American farmers on the family farm, especially those on his route from Minnesota all the way to Washington State. He kept very careful books and he studied detailed reports and he had really good accountants who helped him with this. And this is how he stayed in the black from the very beginning. He, from when he was a boy and he started some of his own entrepreneurial activities and projects, he kept really good records. He was always counting minute costs of expansion, and he never got ahead of himself. And his personal reinvestment, he was careful with it. And the upside in technology, he would only pay for it when he had to or when he really needed to, but he did. He invested in that. He loved research and development. He loved efficiency. If it cost, just for example, if it cost him one dollar to move one ton, one mile, he would look for ways to improve the technology and the management to bring the cost down to 99 cents. And then he contracted for that 99 cents before he expanded. He, he had a contract in hand before he would expand. So he learned this when he was a boy. And it, he simply wouldn't buy a new horse or a new wagon for his first freight business unless he had a long-term contract with a customer 
for dependable cash flow. And this, of course, kept him away from debt and stock dilution all the rest of his life. Now, because he knew the numbers, because he studied them so hard, he never feared any competitors. He knew about their numbers, not because he, he spied on their books, because he just watched what they did and how they spent their money. And he knew that their business models would fail. And he knew that his would succeed because he was building more than a business. He was building a dependable and professional culture of efficiency. Hundreds of towns and cities and grain elevators would all be connected by affordable freight trains, which appeared right on time, down to the minute. Now take a look at, at, at his streamlined business brief for a profitable railroad and how simple it is. Here's what he said. He put this in writing and gave this to all his managers. He said, we must operate the fastest locomotives to pull the longest trains with maximum tonnage over the straightest tracks using the least change in elevation with minimal maintenance costs. <laughs> See how simple that is. Now examine it backwards as he did in launching a permanent railroad. For minimal maintenance costs, he would have to build right the first time, planning far ahead, no ripping up inferior track or carving roadbeds out of granite mountains that were unnecessary, but getting the best routes first. And a huge amount of research and exploration went into this. For example, that long lost pass that was just legendary, the Marias Pass, rumored to have been discovered by an explorer many decades prior, did it even exist? Hill sent new explorers into the mountains for months to search until they found it, and they did find it. It did exist. They found it, and only then could plans be made to connect all the other points on the route to the Pacific. Now look at this one, using the least change in elevation. I mean, they're going over the Rocky Mountains with this railroad. And again, surveyors explored and planned before track crews started blasting and moving rock. And trestles were built right the very first time. The engineers were so careful with this so that every mile of track could take all the weight that would be loaded on, even though there was, as yet, no freight in that part of the world. Now, Hill could see it materializing because he had a plan, according to his business plan for the future. And where would all that freight come from in years to come? It would come out of the barren ground that he was building track over becoming hundreds of millions of tons of valuable agricultural produce. And Hill could see this. Next, look at this, the straightest tracks. Hill invested in the shortest route first before laying circuitous track from changing points on the route because his plan would change. He got the plan down first. And Hill then negotiated for the very best steel out of Europe. He didn't buy cheap steel. He looked for the best. His engineers knew how to, how to get the best. He bought, uh, there was some, a really good quality steel coming out of Belgium. That's what he bought. And then later he negotiated to get really good steel out of Japan. And he intended his track to be permanent, and it is permanent. Most of what he laid is still there carrying trains even to this day. Now, look at this one. Maximum tonnage, and because this is where his operational profits were going to be generated. Small fees for many tons, it scales upwardly very fast. And of course, the longest trains are being pulled by the fastest locomotives. And to get these big engines, he either had to invent them or improve the existing technology through his research and development operations. And he did. That's what he did. The best engineers wanted to work for Hill because he was so serious about improvement and safety and speed and technological breakthroughs of all kinds not just high-speed locomotives, but even more ingenious inventions, which contributed to the overall expansion of all capital. He knew that once technology is being worked on, there will be so many different varieties of technology that will benefit the entire economy. Number three, here's my third principle. He leveraged every form of capital into civilization. And the capital he valued most was not his personal portfolio. It was the land and the people and the freedom of, of the United States. Now, let me repeat that. The land and the people and the freedom of the United States. 
he knew what this combination could do because he'd studied history. From history, he knew that small, morally grounded family farms advance agriculture, always. He knew that advanced agriculture advances technology, always. He knew that advances in technology accelerate civilizational culture. And this is why J.J. Hill spent his capital on the foundations of civilization. He was building a base for explosive business expansion through the proper working of honest government, advanced technology, just war and peace, and free markets. That's what he was doing because he knew for centuries prior these had been driven by the family unit, specifically the small family farm. And Hill knew that Western civilization emerged in Western Europe because average families learned how to cultivate the dirt and then turn it into a free market economy. That's what happened. Now, it, it didn't happen until Christianity came to Western Europe, but Hill understood this and he believed that he could take this cultivation principle, the building of culture, that it could be perfected in America, even in barren North Dakota. And he proved it from Minnesota to Washington State. This is how Hill incubated trillions of dollars of, of American wealth, starting with nothing but the millions of acres of dirt which were touched by his business influence, his railroads that stretched out across the prairies. Now, first, Hill took a close scientific look at the soil between Minnesota and Washington State, and he believed it could be some of America's most fertile in the whole country, and he was proven to be right. But before he invited millions of starving, disadvantaged, lower-class European serfs to settle in these regions, Hill hired scientists to test the soils and the, the nutritional content of the native grasses, the rainfall, the potential cultivation methods that they might need to be using there. And his first testbed experiments with hard wheat outperformed all expectations. So Hill then began issuing the remarkable invitations which would explode American strength of productivity and population and technology and food creation. The driver to all this wealth creation was exactly what Hill predicted it would be, the dirt on small family farms and the character of the grateful, hardworking immigrants who would turn the dirt into forms of vast wealth. To these freedom-starved Europeans, Hill provided unheard of opportunity. He arranged steamship tickets, rail passage west once they got to New York City. And at his own expense, he entrusted homesteaders with free seed varieties. He just gave them. He gave them tools. He gave them male and female cattle and poultry, the very springs of new life. Now, these may have looked like gifts from J.J. Hill, well, and they were, but they were, they were much more than that. They were his active investments in civilization. Hill helped finance grain storage facilities all along his, his railroad. He helped build churches in every small town. And then Hill provided greatly discounted prices for freight once their produce started growing and they needed to move it east and sell it. And Hill, even after all these expenses, Hill still made a profit because every family farm became a powerhouse of productivity. By the 1890s, Hill's trains, the longest trains with the fastest locomotives, were overloaded with goods traveling east. Now look at this drawing. This was his vision for explosive American capital, an average productive family farm next to a dependable rail line con connecting that farm to the world. Hill wanted family farms to be able to sell their grain as far east as New York, 3,000 miles east, and someday 6,000 miles west into China by Hill Company Ocean Steamers. Now here I'm standing in Washington State on land which was once virgin, unbroken prairie. As soon as iron rails could carry pioneering families further and further west into these barren plains, they obtained a few cheap acres from J.J. Hill some gifts of his capital and started prosperous new lives. As families broke the lonely ground and battled harsh northern winters and then planted and then harvested, Hill never stopped fighting for their prosperity. He set up his own experimental farm in Minnesota and spent as much time on it 
as he could, breeding better stock, experimenting with row crops. He kept an eye on farm progress all along his lines. He published a farm journal. He awarded generous prizes for the tallest corn, the fattest steers, and the richest milk. And farm prosperity exploded as labor was converted into many varieties of capital. This is how J.J. Hill leveraged American freedom in the free market economy. His one railroad created small but powerful nodes of national wealth, hundreds of thousands of family farms, farms with the ability to create literally tons of productivity every year. And J.J. Hill's rail lines would then make family labor profitable, ton after boxcar ton. Truly successful entrepreneurs see the future like statesmen do, not as politicians or robber barons or bitter business rivals do. Successful entrepreneurs build entire economies on purpose. Independent business leaders develop vision for national capital, not just personal capital, but both usually grow side by side. Now, by the time J.J. Hill died suddenly and unexpectedly in his 70s, he directly controlled more than $5.6 trillion in productive assets. And that's in today's dollars. Now, he left a personal fortune to his children of $1.4 trillion, just $1.4 trillion in today's dollars. That's just in case you were wondering how his life turned out financially. It turned out very well. But today we must admit that the American government is, is not interested in your long-term success or even America's long-term success. What they want is your compliance with all the new regulations of the Great Reset, which features a broken economy, which permits them to rebuild it in their image. That slogan, Build Back Better, means build back a socialist oligarchy through the abuse of technology with no free markets and endless war against individual liberty. Now their idea of capital is what? It's, it's a compliant population, people who are owned and controlled by the state for the benefit of the state. And this is not what you want. You don't want to be a part of this, which is why you must defeat the technocratic and transhumanist state by rebuilding the free market economy yourself, getting involved yourself, being involved yourself. Now, how do you do this? Do not surrender your freedoms to medical tyranny or political tyranny, and don't play their economic games with inflation and handouts and regulation. Do not get hooked on government money. Choose freedom over restraint. Keep yourself free. Keep the idea of the free market prominent. Building better has always involved independent business entrepreneurs like you doing it quicker and cheaper and stronger and smarter. So study this Harvard Business School definition of entrepreneurial success and then build with integrity. It goes like this, create value through the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. And remember J.J. Hill, maybe all you have today is all he had as a young man, a low-level warehouse job, a few ideas, and a pencil sketch for a transportation system. Remember how many billions of bushels of grain emerged from the small handfuls of seed that he gave to young couples starting out on small acreages. Start thinking about the value of all the capital you can create by finding the opportunity of your life and times, and then spend that capital on civilization.